This is a Pinball News production. Good evening, good avond, welcome to our presentation about Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, for a small introduction, um, Melvin. Hello. <laughs> Me design on Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. Um, I am Barry, owner in, uh, uh, of Dutch Pinball. And uh, yeah, this is a Pinball Expo presentation, and Rens was also up here with us. <laughs> but Rens is also is there. And of course, a lot of more, more of uh, Dutch Pinball guys here, but uh, for now, I'll uh, keep it with this. Um, so yeah. Uh, we are now uh, doing a title for Dutch Pimple Exclusive, DPX, along with Melvin, who did uh, the lead design on Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Alice. And we have uh, some things we want to show you, talk about. Um, first, background and inspiration, the design process, and a little bit about gameplay and software. And after we're done, we have some time for some questions. You start. Can you take it from here? I'll take it from here. So, why Alice? Um, I don't know. Or if people are familiar with, uh, we have to go back like 15, 20 years. Um, there was a company named Zitaware who done Magic Girl, Raza, and made a foam core of Alice in Wonderland. Um, um, as most of you know, and if you don't. There was a um, bankruptcy uh, thing going on with John, and uh, there was a locker for sale that holded a lot of John's personal items, and I acquired those uh, those assets. And when I went through all those things, when I found there was Alice in there from the paper mock-up that most of you know. <clears throat> And the more I looked into it, um, the more I was intrigued to, you know, asking myself the question, can I finish this game or can I even start the game because it was a phone call. Um, so that was kind of a challenge in the beginning because where do you start, you know, you have to uh, um, try to stay original to the concept because that's what intrigued me because Everybody knows Tales of the Arabian Nights, Circus Voltaire, they have that whimsical 90s feeling that everybody loves. So how can I, you know, make this game come to life um, with all the aspects we see today? So this is why I came to Alice from the, uh, it wasn't, I didn't wake up like, oh, you know what, I'm going to make an Alice Adventures in Wonderland pinball, because that's not the first thing you would think. You know, you go to licensed themes, movies, and that sort of stuff. <clears throat> so, everybody knows the Alice's Adventures in Wonderland from the Disney movies. You know, everybody grew up with the um, Old Order book or the 1951 um, cartoon version or even the 2010 uh, movie version. And, of course, everybody knows that's not the story you can use because that's Disney. Um, that also comes to the point that we are talking about the title. So, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, I had to change it for my own peace of mind. Because when I'd done some research on Alice in Wonderland, and even though it was public domain, I don't know how... It was possible, but Disney was able to file a trademark on Alice in Wonderland. And as a small boutique company, you don't want that when you produce these games. <laughs> Disney come knocking at your door and say, you know what? We own you now. Um, they have probably more lawyers than Dutch kind of workers. So, um, yeah, so this is where I had to uh, did an Alice Adventures in Wonderland title, also to create our own little stories to the whole franchise. Everybody knows the the book lines, you know, she go down the rabbit hole, she meets some characters, the Mad Hatter, the White Rabbit, etc., etc. Um, so this is where I started from. 
And one thing that I immediately thought when I was making this game is that I really wanted to create a world under glass. You know, for me it's like, um, I think a pinball should be more than just a pinball to have fun with, you know. it's, it's These days a pinball goes into your home, you know. They don't go out into your arcades or whatever, they go into your home. So you want the best of both worlds. This is why everybody got a painting in their house, you know. Um, you cannot do anything with it, but you can look at it. And that's another aesthetic that I wanted to put in there. So here comes my take on how can I create a magical world under glass so I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna ditch all the original concept of the plastics we know in a game and just try to shove as much world under glass if, you know, there was to some extent that everybody's like, no, you gotta stop. And I look at Renz and he was like, Feature freeze. <laughs> Bill of material. And I'm like, oh, I know, I know. Um, so yeah, that, this is what I wanted to create. Something else that even if the game is turned off, um, that every time you look at it, we create something new. So yeah, the design process we're not going to look at now. Um, we're probably going to uh, go through a few pictures uh, where we see the foam core and the original 2D CAD file and how it transported into the new CAD file we, we did. And the process of making the prototype. And after that, we're going to look at the art because it all started, of course, with, uh, with the black and white version. Everybody knows from the Zombie Yeti. First one, it's a beautiful phone core. Yeah. So this is the original phone core that uh, John mocked up to. Uh, I think his last attempt to, I don't know, make his dreams come true. Um, so everybody can see, you know, it's an amazing looking game. And if you really look closely then, you can see that a lot of stuff on this game is still in the game that you see on the show floor right now. I tried to create as much possible um, so it looked the same. The only thing you guys cannot see is that it looks good from this angle. But if you turn it around, there's nothing there. The rats just stop. There's nothing developed. Um, so, I always say, I said it in, in Chicago as well, this is why we don't have flying cars yet. It looks great on paper, but you got to make it work. And I found it out the hard way because my first Whitewood, well, that didn't go too well. <laughs> um, video recording of that? We have a lot of pictures and videos of that. We'll, show more, pic we'll, we'll show more pictures and, and also some videos of the prototyping process. Um, so this is basically the first uh, file, uh, basically the only file of the, the actual game we had is a 2D CAD file. We had some iterations, but this is it was the best one. Yeah, so this was the original one that I knew already a little bit what John wanted, but it didn't make a lot of sense um, because this was the main issue right there. So if you see that it was a spinning watch, something he wanted to do. But if you look really closely, how can you get with this flipper right there and make sure the ball goes back? It's just a brick shot. It blocks. It doesn't do anything. There's never ever been intended to be a flipper here because you should have a flipper right there to make this shot. So I had to, the first thing I, I did after I, I created the ball guy, so I was already looking to change that shot right there. Um, and it's the same. John had a different way of doing things, you know, with, with metal guides here, with, with posts in between, and just, why would you do that? Because if you got a rubber on there, it just ricochets the ball. So I said, you know what, let's change this. And there are so many features, even if you look at the ramps, um, there was no way in hell you could get a ball up there because it was never developed. John wanted some, mag you know, magnete levitating magnets. Well, that didn't work out pretty well in Magic Girls, everybody know. Um, so, and here we also came to the hardest part of creating this game. That was getting the ramp done. The ramp you see right here, underneath the, uh, the mini play field. It has to go around, <coughs> but it also had to go up there. And John never designed anything to go there. So, um, um, I think 
in the end, I done 54 different models of that ramp just to get the flow right and to have it fit in exactly the shape of the mini playfield and to go around it. Yeah, unfortunately, Gauthier is not here because he, uh, you made his life uh, a living hell living hell. <laughs> <laughs> with 45 revisions of the, of the right ramp. Uh, so here is the. Uh, that's yeah. The castle so, we now have, so it's maybe. Nice yeah, if you go back, you can see. You don't see it right straight away, but you can see a lot of different changes I made, and especially in the mini playfield area. Um, if you can see right here, I added a another insert. I changed the whole clock shot right there. If you can switch it back to account, you see. But now you do can make the clock shot right there, or it can go into the side of the scoop if it's a, if it's a slow ball, or it can bounce on the rubber right here and then bounces back up there. So you create a whole new style with that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of changes you don't see on the outside, but uh, I think every post, every ball guy, I changed so many times. Um, you live and learn, we say. And it's hard because if you, if, you, if you make a game from new and you draw the first lines, um, you are the creator of your own imagination. And now I had to work with something even harder because if I change the shape or the design, why is it still the game from the you know, what John wanted to do. Um, I have some people even now telling me, like, why didn't you use flippers on the mini playfield? I said, was that in the original design? Because if I'd done and it said, oh, it played better, I would sure have people say, yeah, but John wanted magnets there. So there are some things I really had to change to make it work, like the clock shot. And I, I knew from the, when you look at the pictures later, you can see I already was working on having that clock envisioned because I was looking at uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, they had the ball with the little display and, and, and so that was already something I really wanted to do. This is some pictures of for us white with prototyping process. I think this is basically the first <laughs> glue. So this is, this is glue my, uh, yeah, so this is my, um, a lot of hot glue. Yeah. Um, I came up to Barry when I told what I wanted to do, and he's like, uh, you know what? Uh, I believe in you, but just show me what you can do. I was like, okay. Got home, and I started working. So these are my first prototype ramps I made. Um, some hot glue and uh, some bending. So this has already been based a little bit on John's old concept. You can still see the old metal guide right there that's not in the right place. You still see the old inserts. But this is already just to see if the lines were good and I have something to work with on the game. Yeah, so here you can see already, um, I was trying to do something else. As you can see the hole right there. So the ball couldn't get up there because he wanted to do have like a, a up kicker and probably with a magnet or something. Yeah. Yeah. So he, that didn't work because then you had to go through the ramp. Um, so I was looking to I don't know make it you know more bendable. That didn't work. <laughs> also very nice. Yes, this is my very <laughs> first uh, attempt to make it a ramp. Yeah. It did work a little, so that's it good. Worked. Here you can see my uh, first idea, because nothing was finished, so John's um, rent just ended here. There was nothing there, so what I wanted to do is said, okay, I need to do an up-down ramp type of thing, and also to get the lock system still, because even this ball right there, John had a swirly system, but the problem was that even if you have a rollback from a ball, the ball was trapped, because John never made a hole right there to get the ball out. This is already, I know some pictures are a little bit reversed on the, uh, 
on the slideshow. This is already at a later stage. Um, there are some iterations in between, but here you can already see that I already started working on a lot of stuff. You know, I already had the mini play field there. I had the, um, the rams going around it. Um, my main idea with the new clock shot right here was already working. Um, I changed this for later so it can also go into the side of the scoop. Um, um, this ball guy here I made shorter so now when you shot this the ball could ricochet off this rubber and then bounce back to this one to give you more of the momentum in the uh, in the games. <clears throat> yeah this is already uh, my later so if you can see right now if you look closely you can see that the ramps are going to a hard shape. Here's my first take already on the uh, on the clock, what I wanted to do with the screen right there. This is how it would look uh, with the clear ramps. Already some iterations further with the clock, as you can see. Um, yeah, basically so the bottom side is, is based on, on uh, what we already did for Lebowski. So we use uh, same as Lebowski, middle main board, front main board, and some, some smaller boards for, for LEDs. And uh, this basically makes it uh, much easily, easier to assemble because you don't need super many uh, wires. Um, and for the rest also, yeah, we try to do it, uh, to take as much things from Lebowski uh, for Alice. So also the same flipper uh, units, same slingshots, also a subway system uh, like Lebowski. And uh, only a, a couple of parts are different. Yeah, we have a drop target. Shouldn't lay further is, is mirrored, but, but yeah, it's basically all the same technology. Yeah, and this is the, the first. Uh, I say that these are uh, plexiglass uh, PCB prototypes to see if everything fits with the hardware. And after that, you go to the to the actual PCB design. Yeah. So the first thing I asked Barry is when I was developing this game is like. Just give me everything that's in Lebowski because, you know, everything's been tested for many years. So the more I can put into that game that's off the shelf, that works, less technical parts are in there. And I don't believe from, uh, I think there's one lock system up and down bracket, but most of it is just 95% that's already in Lebowski. And a lot of stuff right there, you can just go to, you know, it doesn't make any difference if you have your game in the US or in Australia. You can get just Valley Williams parts and just, you know, knock yourself out. So um, that's the good thing about it. So Barry did all the designs for the uh, for the PCBs and tracing and all that stuff. I guess just new. Friends. Yeah, I think this was Probably. this was already. I think because I changed so many RAM designs, I think this was already being close to the uh, because I already see the the spinner idea I had right there. So I believe this was already for almost the final design of the ramps, even how it this looks. It still has, um, it says one insert from John said, find all four suits. So how are you gonna find four suits with only three inserts? I don't know. So I said, you know what, let's add another insert then. Ah. The lanterns. <laughs> My fame. <laughs> Yeah, so... Um, everybody fa favorite part. Yeah, everybody favorite part. So I was uh, missing something, you know, I wanted to create a world under glass, so... Um, my idea was, I found these lanterns, and I was like, you know what? Let me try to put them in the game. And I first had them in the four ways you see right there. Later on, I put one on the other side of the, uh, of the, of the ramp. But it gave me a whole new... That was my first experience into creating a world under glass, you know, with these kind of stuff. But you also got to think about, okay, can this break easy because, you know, and there were like, I don't know, like a vinyl type of stuff. So if you just, uh, these don't come from Lior, uh, who makes all the sculpts. This is from uh, a company uh, we buy from here. Um, but yeah, they're flexible. They don't break that easy. They're easy to replace if something happens. Um, so yeah, that was my first take on creating this. Awesome. The 
the mushroom. <laughs> yeah, I was already experiencing doing some stuff with the mushroom right here. You already can see I have a, a disc system in here. And this was my fir first iteration in the squirrel system because everybody knows that um, you got, in most games, you have like spinning discs with a uh, piece of rubber or some grip material on it, but it just doesn't grip like it's supposed to be gripping. Um, so this was my first take on a squirrel, and if you see now in a production game, the squirrels are even uh, smaller and double rotate, so the more crazy pattern you make, some work, some don't. And I now found a sweet spot to really to do a grab on the... Uh, because the black area you see right there is raised above the playfield. So it means that the white part that is now blue on the production game is, is, is leveled, so you always can level out your spinning disc. And then this is really where the ball gets into and it grabs it while it's rotating. So it's rotating outside and it makes sure that the ball swirls back in. So this is the first take on the, on the, on the sculpted plastics because we really wanted the world on the glass. So this is like iteration one, I guess. And uh, if you've seen the, the actual game, it's changed a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kept pushing on, um, you know, once we got a hold of this, I was like, ah, you know, it looks it looks good, but I'm missing a lot of details. And I was just, we were pushing and pushing and pushing to the point that we were, even Leroy said, you must be out of your mind. Because this, was simple. this was really simple compared to what we have right now, so. Yeah, so here you can see the, uh, the screen already in. Um, I still have the old black and white trans light in there. Second whitewood? Yeah, so this is my second whitewood. Here you can already see the uh, four inserts I changed. This was already at the final design of the, uh, uh, of the ball guides. Uh, I wanted, in the end, uh, mirror ball guides because, you know, the game's already pretty dark and you can create a lot more light with them. Yeah, I think this was the final... Was this the final one with I made? I think so, yeah. Yeah, right. After this we went into full color. Yeah. So here's also the first version with, with a painted uh, trans light. It was the first artwork that was done by, by Freak. <laughs> Same artist we did to the Lebowski Playfield. Also did every all, all of the, the artwork on Alice. <clears throat> yeah, so this is already the, almost the final. Here you can already can see a sculpt I wanted to put in there. Um, here I already knew where every swing was already laid out. Everything was finished. The game was in a playable state. Um, here already uh, almost the pr production wraps were already in. Yeah, so um, this was the first prototype with the color print on it. And here you can see in white already, I don't think this was final, but um, here you can already see that the lanterns, one is on the other side. Here we already created most of the, uh, of all the plastic that were sculpted. I think we have some test videos of the game. <laughs> yeah, so. These are some of my first tests I ever done. I even rode on the playfield, like uh, the same as any other side, made smaller or whatever. Ramp shot for both here's, of the yeah, Here's my first attempt <laughs> to see if the ramp could backhand. And uh, here you can still see old spinning stuff that didn't work. You can even see that John had a target right there. You can even you can even go there. This is my first take on my spinning disc system to see if it worked, and it did. So not a ramp shot. Here you can also see the... Uh, I had a display on the clock, just the square one. Yeah, so um, the game we have right now set up, 
it has a rubber right here. Originally, and it's still in there, what I wanted to do is uh, I wanted to create a game, you know, that's super easy for even for kids to play and understand. But also, if you want to master uh, the game itself with the mini play field, you have different options to set up the, uh, the rebound of it. So, as you can see, all the games down the show floor have one rebound here, so it comes out, it bounces up here, goes into the, uh, to the saucer, and then the saucer does only make sure that the ball just don't go out the drain, but just give you a little bit more play. What you can do when you're in a home environment, you can even take this one out, you can set it up like this. These posts, you can even make bigger or smaller, so you can create as much as difficulty if you want. You can see still there, I had a... The first idea was that the ball just would go around it, but I, I think it was just stupid, so I changed it later on. This is also an old picture. You can still see here that uh, it has the old post, and later I removed it because I wanted to have more vision under the play field and also create a world that is like floating. Ah, yes. Revision zero. <laughs> Revision zero. So this is my first attempt at making that gate we all see now. Um, so I printed like an, uh, like an angle so the ball would go there and just fall off the, uh, fall off the play field. Yeah, so this was finally the inserts were mirrored. Yeah, so the insert were originally because they have only one mold for this. Um, you see that it was um, it was rotated. So, but I just thought that the aesthetics just looked very bad. So we had to create a brand new mold just for that insert because it would. I have a bit of OCD, so a, a bit. <clears throat> Um, so I didn't want it to be flipped because mirrored, it looks just strange to have two of the same inserts. Yeah, if you look at the game down, they are perfectly in mirror. Correct. Perfectly aligned. Yes. Is this a video too? Or? Yeah, no, I think it's... Like the balls. Yeah, this is the, uh, the captive ball system. Because I, I didn't like it that you would just shoot around and that was it. And now the whole purpose of it is that the Queen of Hearts, she sits here. These are some guards, and what you do also in a wizard mode is you knock her off the throne. So what you do with the uh, with the ball and the uh, the magnetic, you just you know you can ricochet the ball through it. it, gives you a little bit more of an extra, or else it was just you know there was no purpose for the mini playfield. So this was original John's design. So we have to go back a little bit further. I don't know what John wanted, but I don't. Uh, Nobody likes dimples, right? But craters, you don't want that because what do you think happens if that ball drops from that height onto your full play field? So I had to create a gate to get it and then also to get the ball, you know, into the ramp itself. Yeah, so here's my uh, printed gate to see if it would work, if the ball came off. And it worked, so that's good. <laughs> I think here's me playing and showing Barry, look, it works. <laughs> it was like, okay, great. <clears throat> Wait, this one's fun. <laughs> oh, this one's fun. <laughs> so this is my topper to begin with. <laughs> um, I already had an idea very quickly that I wanted a cat topper for the Cheshire cat. <clears throat> well, <laughs> this is not what he looks right now, but uh, so what I, um, everybody knows that everybody likes toppers. They don't like plastic toppers these days. Everybody wants something, you know, what you pay for. Um, but I also wanted to create a topper that sits under 23 centimeters because not everybody has a high ceiling. So I think 22, 23 centimeters is the best way to get it in. So if you look closely at the topper later, you can see I made it so it looks like he's coming out of the back box. And this was my the other. This was my idea first to see. Okay, I wanted screens behind his eyes to see what can I do. But 
I found out that um, if, you look, if you look from side to side, there was nothing. So I found some glass lenses that, um, you know, made it look much more uh, real. So this was the uh, first design. And as you already can see, um, I try to put his head inside the cabinet like he's, you know, because the Cheshire cat can, can go from every, come from everywhere. So, uh, and also to keep the space down uh, as a topper itself. This is the topper we all know, uh, know now today. This is the, uh, not really a production model because this is really still the prototype. Even the ones that are on the machines right here, they are missing uh, a lack of detail. You can see it right here. So if you look on the playfield itself, it has the small sculpt for the scoop. And all the details you see there, they, those will be the production. But I had this topper earlier than the Leor sculpts. So every detail you see right here on his nose and everything, that will be in your, if anybody ordered one, it will be your production game. So it will even look more detailed than it is right now. An animation for the people who like to see this is the cat file. All the parts, bottom parts. <laughs> Almost a finished version. I think we are at revision 1708 or something. Yes, correct. 718, 1718. That's how many changes I made to the game. Um, nice thing about it, everybody knows from servicing games with a media play field can be a pain in the ass. You know, getting all the parts of. And when I developed a mini play field, in the master plastic that's on top of the, uh, the mini play field, there are three holes. Um, with those three screws, just so you can keep it all together, undo two or three wirings from the uh, underneath the playfield, and then you can lift out the whole mini playfield in less than. I think if you would time me, and I have access, I can do in like 30 to 45 seconds. And it also makes servicing as at home super easy. Same with the ramps. You can take out the ramps uh, without even removing the up and down ramp without removing any of the lanterns. Um, and, you know, so it makes, with, it, with these two ramps out and the mini play field, it's in like less than a few minutes. And then you can just clean the game, service whatever you want to do. So now we're going to look at a little bit of the art, starting with the translite, which of course already was done by Zombie Yeti. We reached out to him to to see if he could finish it, but yeah, of course he's working with uh, with Stern now full time. So he unfortunately he couldn't. So we had to find another artist for uh, for finishing the art. Um, I think we had maybe tried five or six other artists, and finally we decided to to get uh, to the artist we already know from Lebowski, Freek van Hagen from Breda in the Netherlands, and he I think this is the first version he sent to us. Yeah, he also sent some. Some some uh, minor parts, but this is the first assembly of the, the colorized version. <coughs> it already looks a lot like what it is today, but um, I'm just going to skip through some pictures because we thought it was too light and didn't have enough contrast or uh, how do you say that yeah. saturation. Yeah, and I, I was the guy who wanted a lot of saturation, and I didn't like the cat. I had a. Um, to maybe to uh, Barry still hates me for it. I'm quite demanding, and if I have a vision of something, I just more and more, and even with the colors. And he was like, "When do you stop?" But now you can see it better. So here you got a different iteration. So a lot darker, a lot more contrast. Also the, the skin. Can of you the... can you bring it back to the black and white one second? Oh yeah, of course. Okay, so if you now you can see, I did change something from the original art. <laughs> if you look at her face right there. And Barry's going to change it. I love her much better. She has a nicer face. Um, I didn't like the other uh, Queen of Hearts. She looks bored. Um, so that's really one thing I had to change from Zombie Eddie's art. Also the best old t-shirt, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, I think, um, after that we have oh, yeah, some, some minor details in the background. Some more coloring on, on the cat more to make it more blue. Here it's more green. 
finally the logo, which was first purple, blue, bluish purple. And then we decided to do it in red, like it is now. And I think the next one is just some... Yeah, yeah later on, yeah, yeah, yeah. OCD. Oh right yeah, there. here comes my OCD. <laughs> so uh, when I got the other translate, um, I put it in my game. And the top of the gate, you see the arrow, wasn't in the middle of the, of the lock. On the lock. <laughs> and I told Barry, I said, the gate is not in the middle of the lock. He said, what are you, are you kidding me? I said, nope. 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 You gotta move it. My OCD kicks in, I didn't want it. The same, same, really as, so same as this guy right here. He was in front of our arm, said, move it somewhere else. Those are things will probably nobody ever noticed, but trust me, look at the gate while I was doing it. He still hates me for it. <laughs> So that's sometimes how the OCD kicks in. <coughs> so this is the final, final version. Perfectly centered gate. <laughs> <laughs> so playfield art, of course, we had to do from scratch. There was uh, on on the phone call there was uh, a design of the playfield, but it was basically just parts from the translate, copy paste to the playfield. So. And we wanted to do something really new, so we completely started over uh, with the playfield. And I think this is the first sketch uh, Frey did. This is the, the, the real the first one. And I think a lot of change uh, since uh, this first version. <laughs> yeah, a lot of only, people... Only the bottom... bottom uh, yeah, we, uh, we already knew it pretty easy that I wanted to create something that you would, you know, you would walk into, and this is the world to you. So I wanted this to be like a 3D look, and then you walk into the Wonderland. Everybody, a lot of people thought that we, you know, we used AI or anything for free art we did on it. But as you can see, we really um, took a lot of alliterations to, to uh, everything was, you know, hand drawn, then colorized. Yeah, so we have a little bit more detail on the forest and some more detailing on the, on the layer for the Jabberwock. Also a little bit of stuff on the, on the guard area, but it's, I think, Changed a lot, and, and of course, also everything around the inserts has changed. I think on the right, it's basically what it is now, but it's, yeah, we removed the, the, yeah, the portrait from Lewis Carroll. Portrait. It's the writer of the book. <coughs> so this was more to to explain uh, Freek which areas had to do what. <coughs> so on the left, the, the the one on the left is the um, the croquet area. Yeah. And, uh, with a banner which we also moved to another place. I'm just going to skip through these because there are like 20 or so. Some color, colorization, more flamingos added. Also more colorization on the forest with the caterpillars still there. Also was removed. The guard area, the shot to the lair, lair. <coughs> Yeah, so Barry and me done all the most of the art direction. If we wanted something, then Barry would write something. We tell our ideas. Um, we were, you know, pretty. I knew already what I wanted. Barry knew what he wanted. So sometimes we had to combine stuff. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of different ideas on the inserts for the modes. Yep. Here with the characters. And then we like this one. No, we didn't like this one at oh, first. You did, yeah, <laughs> we didn't like it. I liked the colors. And then, so then we went to something else. Yeah. And then we we lost the file. <laughs> so I basically Correct. did some trickery in Photoshop to get this one back. And 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 that is now the background in the final version. So uh, here also the, the the left inlay with the uh, with the tiles and, uh, and the red carpet. Also another another try for the inserts with I think the Queen, yeah. Yeah. Another, another one with Alice. <laughs> that wasn't it. And eventually, yeah, I, I got the, the other design back. Like this. And I think this is now almost final, yeah. Yeah. So this is like yeah, the the, the ink file, the Photoshop file, which is about know, one gigabyte and, and eight hundred layers. <coughs> And then eventually combined into another file with I don't know this is like two yes. five, five gigabytes or something. Yeah, this is the final design, right? Yeah, yeah. very high res. Yeah. yeah, this is the one. Yeah. There still will be a very very minor changes to this, but uh, this is basically it. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's some some small details you will never notice without telling me, but there's some stuff I need. So in a production game, there would be f just slight changes in some insert texts and whatever, but if I wouldn't tell you, you wouldn't notice on a production game. The first game we spelled with caterpillar wrong. Yeah, <laughs> my prototypes has caterpillar with two T's. It was the best. So this is the first sketch on the mini play field, which is basically already something we have now. So the idea was to, to have the throne in the back and, and to have the little, some kind of swirls with the tiles where the magnets are, because the magnets are right in, in the center of the, of the swirls. And we wanted the swirls more like to be like tiles falling down, so that's the next sketch. And the targets on the left are representing the, the guards, so we also wanted the guards there. But not many, super many iterations. No, we had that nice one. top view of the queen. No. Yeah, so yeah, we were pretty easy <coughs> on this one. Yeah. I think this is already one one final ink, one final color. Yeah, I think this was already one of the final versions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So the same. Uh, as with the playfield, also the cabinet didn't have any art. Well, there was some. I don't know. It's this. No, I don't have the original sketch that we have. Oh, but all, but that was also, you know. Not but you could have seen it in the uh, in the foam core. We, you know, what it was a mock up of everything they put together and something. So this was also a first ske sketch. Some elements of uh, the Jabberwock is the same as the Transfly, but basically all the other elements are. Newly drawn for uh, for the cabinet as well. Also with some some characters we eventually didn't like, or I didn't like. Them. <laughs> you didn't like them. <laughs> I said okay, just put them on the inner plates then. Yeah, yeah. So the are they called? Uh, yeah, the, the Tweedledee, Tweedledum, yeah, whatever. Tweedledum. Yeah, uh, characters are now on the on the inner R blades. Yes, yes, yes. So um, also for sketches, some sketches for the for the uh, back box art. But in the end, we decided to do the back, uh, the back box just Alice and just we, yeah. without any other characters. Because it was just, you know, you copy too many, many things that was already in the playfield, and we just wanted something new and fresh. It's too repetitive. Yeah. yeah. So eventually, we got this first you know, Alice only back box. A lot of talk about this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the queen. Also, this is more like what we do with, with Fritz. We, we send some sketch, or he sends a square sketch, and then we take it to Photoshop, we make some, some notes, and then we send it back so he knows what to do, and then we, we get final art or the next uh, sketch back. And eventually, this is the art package. Yeah, this is the final art package. Yeah, we already talked a little bit about the DP compatibility. Um, yeah, basically redesigning stuff that didn't work. Also, <laughs> working with a small team. Yeah, it was just uh, yeah, we we had a really small team. It was uh, really me and Barry who done. You know, I did all the design of the game. Barry helped me with uh, making the PCB designs. But we really didn't have a, a true engineer into the company. Um, we had an amazing guy that we. Did all the Fusion 360 work for me, and uh, he was great to work with, so he helped out a lot. Um, but yeah, you know, if you have a small team, uh, it makes your life pretty hard sometimes. So, but for the small team we had, I think we done an amazing job in getting a game. We worked about eight to ten months on this game from start to finish. So I think with the with with a few people we have, I think we did an amazing job. So, about gameplay, um, I think that these days pinballs are too overcomplicated, you know? You have like a rule sheet, like a, like a dictionary telling you where to go and I was like, you know, I want to create a game that is easy to understand for my kids, for anybody who just can go into pinball, like in the 90s, um, and still make it hard for the experienced player and only, you know what? I only want something to blink that's needed. You don't want 20,000 things these days blink and you're like, okay, what is up? What's going on? And you have to make decisions and 
You know, and that's also the point of a stop and go. You have a scoop, you know, and when you have a multi ball or whatever, you just want it to relax. It comes out of the scoop, but you want to wait. You want to read the things that it just easily says on the screen shoot the ramp to qualify mode, shoot the scoop to start a mode. That's what you want. You know, that's what I believe I want, and uh, it's just too overcomplicated. So, um, um, same with the rules, you know. Um, I didn't want a linear game. Everybody knows you gotta chase the white rabbit, then you, you follow all the lines through the book, but you can do that if you do the right skill shot. But as soon as you hit a pop bumper, even in your skill shot, that mode will change. So every time you play a game new, it will start in a different way. Um, same as the wizard mode. You can make it as hard or easy as you want. You, from the first ball you play, you already play your wizard mode. Because the wizard mode is to defeat the queen of hearts, and her 21 cards. But you only got 60 seconds to do that in the wizard mode. It's really difficult. So what you do, you shoot the U-turn to paint the roses red. You go to the courthouse, to the courtroom. And every time you go there, and you beat down a guard from targets, it will be deducted of your wizard mode. So you can make it as hard or as easy as you want. So also pretty experienced player. And also, you know, um, I wanted to have side quests in there because a lot of things in gameplay you don't see because you're too focused on the linear gaming that you always do. So what we do, um, if some modes have been played, the game will force you to do the side quests. So you take more out of the game itself and you understand that the next try you do the game, maybe you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to first collect all the side quests. I'm going to get all the ball saves in and just to, or all the multipliers in, and then go into your modes. <laughs> so now have a look at some animations. We have to be a little bit yeah, quick at things well, before I feel we went to some questions, but this is more like to show uh, some of the animation work. Uh, it's also very traditional, you know, frame-by-frame -frame animation work combined with some uh, trickery and after effects. And basically where we start is, is just with, with some simple sketches, and after that we do uh, an animatic, and then after that it gets colorized and fully animated just to show some stuff. So this is the army of cards mode. <coughs> so we all have, you know, like a mode start, then we have a, a, a loop when the mode's running, then we have a hit, and the end of the mode. Clearly the animators are not familiar with uh, slang and pinball, so they have all the we have text, we have mode completed in there. But <coughs> so finally, finally it looks like this. That's the intro, the loop, the hit. color in, in one go because it's so much work to, to do all the animations so you have to do a, a sketch for us black and white and then a full colorized version John Boaduke during this project, uh, no, no direct involvement, uh, no creative consulting, not even a single penny to him. Don't you think it's a little bit, well, cold? Cold? Um, if you're familiar with John, I don't think the cold <laughs> term is the best. Um, I think um, John um, did a lot of things that weren't right. When I acquired the lockers, I, you know, all the money went to those people who got hurt by John. 
John did contact me because in the lockers were a lot of personal items from him. I told him, listen, um, I don't feel like I own the rights to hold your, school, your, your daughter's high school diploma or your pictures for your kids or whatever, so you can have it back. He said, I can be your silent partner. I said, no, thank you. Um, and uh, that was about it. So I have no um, feeling to get uh, John involved. He will never be. Uh, he, did, he doesn't get a single dime out of it. Um, so no, I don't feel uh, cold. <laughs> Any other questions? If I if I ever need to replace a part like a switch or a coil, are they easy to get? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we basically use all the parts. We also use the Lebowski, which are uh, as we call them industry standard parts. So basically, every specific pinball part you can get a pinball life or a planetary pinball or a pinball shop or whatever. So they're simply Barry Williams parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's basically them. If I understood well, the system is limited to only 500 units? Correct, yeah. The, um, the whole DPX vision is, um, I think these days that pinball is not limited anymore. How do you call it limited if some company makes 5,000 or 8,000 pinball machines or a collector's edition that's 1,000? I know they got to make money, but there's nothing collectible about it. And I think 500 is the sweet spot that they always used to do. I had a discussion with Barry in the beginning, was 350 was my magic number, and he said, no, let's push it to 500. And that's where DPX stands for, is for like, if you buy a game from the DPX label, um, you are always guaranteed we will never rerun a game, not in a different color, not in a different lifetime, it's 500 and that's it. Now it seems that it's already sold out, uh, so yes, a lot of folks will so miss it. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> Any more questions? No? Well, thank you all for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.